Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Intermarkan Dialogue. It's a pleasure to see uh, all of you with us um, for this discussion on, uh, on Venezuela this morning. Um, I had a, a professor at, in graduate school who always uh, was critical of all the graduate students because they said they used the word crisis to describe any bad situation. Um, but I think by any definition uh, of the term crisis um, applies today uh, uh, to Venezuela, and crisis probably with, with all caps uh, as well. Uh, the facts uh, on the ground and the situation have been amply document documented and are widely known to, I assume, everybody uh, in this room. Uh, the economic, political, security, institutional, constitutional, and humanitarian uh, dimensions are, are, are clearly uh, heartbreaking. So I think the, this morning there's no need to review and go all, over all of that, uh, but rather we should try to focus on what some of the paths and scenarios out of the crisis uh, might be, uh, how it could be possibly resolved, and hopefully in a democratic and a, and a peaceful fashion. Um, there's not only, I think, broad agreement on the gravity of the situation, there's also um, and the unprecedented nature of the crisis that we haven't seen, uh, certainly in recent memory and certainly in Latin America, uh, but that also that Venezuela is now at a crucial moment, at a sort of a, 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 a turning point, a make or break uh, moment uh, with the vote that's coming up this Sunday, next Sunday, on um, rewriting the con country's constitution. Uh, which, which President Maduro seems determined uh, to pursue. Uh, this move is widely seen by many as another, uh, yet another uh, power grab by the Venezuelan government, uh, which would erase any trace or semblance of democratic rule. And of course, uh, as was demonstrated in a recent popular consultation uh, in Venezuela, I guess a week ago last Sunday, uh, is overwhelmingly rejected by the vast majority of Venezuelans um, that got over 7 million votes uh, to uh, oppose this move, as well, of course, as the international community, which has, including the U.S. government, which is also um, very concerned about um, this development on Sunday. Uh, the idea of the session this morning is to engage in a, in a wide-ranging conversation about what we can expect on Sunday and the following days, what it all means, and take into account many rapidly uh, uh, developing uh, elements, including uh, the street protests uh, that started, uh, this round started in early April, triggered by a decision of the court, which essentially stripped the National Assembly uh, of, what, of its powers. Uh, nearly 100 people have been killed in, in those protests since then. Um, there was a decision to move to house arrest um, Leopoldo Lopez uh, after th serving uh, over three years uh, in prison, unjustly in prison. Um, and of course, there are a series of strikes. There's a strike that's being called for, I guess, tomorrow morning. Uh, starting at 6 o'clock, a national strike. There was a strike last week. So there's a lot happening and a lot to uh, analyze. Um, and one of the reasons why I think we don't have to spend time this morning describing the situation is because of the uh, superb uh, and scrupulous journalistic work of Phil Gunson, uh, who has spent nearly four decades covering uh, Latin America. He knows the region extremely well and has lived in Caracas uh, since 1999, uh, the, year, uh, the year that Chavez uh, started to rule in Venezuela and he took office. Uh, I think no one has covered Venezuela more extensively and more perceptively uh, over the last two decades uh, than Phil. I personally have benefited a lot from his insights 
number of visits that I made to Caracas in the early days of Chavez when we met uh, regularly. Uh, and of course, uh, reading his articles, uh, excellent articles in The Economist, uh, Time Magazine, Newsweek, Miami Herald, and other media outlets. Um, since 2015, he has been a senior analyst with the International Crisis Group, uh, covering the Andes, and but essentially focusing on Venezuela, uh, writing reports, and carrying out advocacy on, on the crisis. Uh, he had just arrived in Washington yesterday. He is going back to Caracas uh, tonight um, uh, to cover the, uh, this, the, the situation there, which I think is uh, very uncertain and, and something we want to talk about. And uh, he has had a number of meetings uh, in Washington, and we're absolutely thrilled to welcome him to the Inter-American Dialogue uh, this morning. Uh, to share his thoughts and engage in a conversation with me and then, and then with all of you about Venezuela and where it might be headed. I do want to just recognize the, uh, the, the collaboration, the dialogue continues to have with the International Crisis Group and with uh, and recognize the, the, the director of the Washington office, Jen Leonard. Um, and we hope uh, we had a recent meeting on uh, the MODIS in uh, Central America with uh, ICG, and we hope to do more with ICG uh, as well. But this morning, the focus is on uh, Venezuela. So let me start with a few questions, um, and, then, uh, and then we'll invite and encourage your own comments and, and have a good discussion this morning. Um, Phil, welcome again, and uh, it's great to have you with us. Uh, I guess the first question is if we, we could just get right to the, to the issue about this Sunday's vote. Um, as we were discussing earlier, when this was first announced, I guess I was skeptical that this was actually going to happen because it seemed like a pretty crazy idea and was something that both Venezuelans, with people within Venezuela and outside of Venezuela, uh, did not support. Uh, and yet, um, President Maduro seems determined to to go ahead with it, and there's no going back at this point. Um, is your sense that this is a real turning point? We've used the word turning point uh, in the history, in, this, in the years of Chavez, now of Maduro, many times, and it's a little bit of overuse. This is the turning point, and it never quite seems to be the turning point that many of us uh, expect. Uh, is this vote on Sunday and the situation we're in now? different in some ways. If you could just put that in context, and, and, and how so? Well, first of all, thanks very much for the invitation. Thanks, uh, and thanks for those generous remarks. We, I mean, I, I, I sympathize with the, with the business of uh, not knowing quite how to describe it, because we're running out. We've used precipice. We've <laughs> used all sorts of different metaphors. And really, you know, when you've been on, a press, on the side of a precipice for so long, as Venezuela has, I mean, you start thinking, what, what are you going to say next? At the bottom of the ravine, you know? <laughs> Um, no, I mean, it, this is a very, very serious moment. I think probably the best way to describe it is to say, ever since Chavez came to power, and, and, and as, as you said, I, I have the good fortune or the bad fortune to watch it at close quarters from, from more or less from the moment that Chavez took office. And it's been like, a, like slicing a salami. I mean, when Chavez came to power, clearly Venezuelan democracy was not in great shape. Chavez was democratically elected, and the Constitution of 1999, with all its flaws, uh, is, broadly speaking, a democratic constitution, a separation of powers. Um, it's perfectly possible to govern democratically with that constitution. It's not been done lately, but it, but it could be done. Um, but what has happened, of course, over that period is that these institutions have been steadily dismantled. They've either been um, dismantled in, in, in the sense that you know reforms or laws have been passed that have, that have taken away powers. Of, um, or, or affected the separation of powers, um, or simply by overriding what's in the Constitution and overriding what's in the law, as has increasingly been the case, the, the Constitution has been hollowed out. The institutions have been hollowed out. They have no real um, meaning. I mean, it, Maduro now changed, for example, he's quite capable of having his tame Supreme Court say that the powers that actually under the Constitution belong to the Fiscal General, to the Attorney General, or whatever you want to call her, now belong to the Defensoria del Pueblo, the Ombudsman. That's not in the Constitution. There's no way you can do that. It's a, it's, it, it, it gives 
it gives you know serious responsible professional lawyers, particularly constitutional lawyers, nightmares what goes on. But of course, it's not the same to override the existing constitution to, to ride roughshod through it as to completely throw it out of a window. And I think that whilst you might argue that after the 30th of July, Maduro will have, the government collectively, will have no more de facto power than they have right now, nonetheless, you could say, I mean, if you want to pick a date, then the 30th of July is the date at which Venezuelan democracy is abolished. Um, there will be um, in power what amounts to, you could perhaps compare it to what happened under the French Revolution. I mean, a committee, basically, that is capable of doing everything from jailing anybody without, without charges, to completely restructuring the state. So it's, I don't know whether we call it a turning point or what, but, but whatever the metaphor you want to use, it's an extremely serious juncture. How, how and you you have no question that this is going to go forward and it's going to happen. I mean that we're going to have this assembly and this will. There's no there's no pulling back and no stopping at this point. Well, it, it it could be stopped or it could be postponed. I mean, in theory at least. And I have the sense, and it's always difficult to know what's really going on inside, not just the head of Maduro, but but what's talked about. Um, between four walls by, by the people in the inner circle of power in Venezuela. I have the sense that Maduro, if he were free to do so, might be willing to engage in that negotiation. And in fact, he's given a few signals in, in recent days. He said things like, um, the, he claimed that the opposition had asked him to postpone the constituent assembly election in exchange for, in order to give them time to register their candidate. That's ridiculous. The opposition didn't do that. But it does sound like a sort of, almost a plea for help. It's like, say something like that. So he, there, there, is, there are ways in which it could happen. There's, a, there's a Recurso de Amparo, I'm not quite sure how you say that in English, a, a petition before the Supreme Court, which would allow Maduro to say, you know, if he ordered the Supreme Court to obey it, or to, 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 to effect it, would allow Maduro to say, well, you know, we have to, the Supreme Court's independent, we have to postpone this or hold off because the basis comicial is the framework for electing this assembly is unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. I don't think he's going to do it. I mean, I think that the, I think that the cost at this point to Maduro personally within the, within the, uh, the power struggle that goes on within the regime, let's call it that, the, the, because there are factions within the regime, it would cost him so much at this point to abandon that because there are people within the regime, and let's name them, Diosdado Cabello is one of the most prominent, obviously, who are, appear to be deeply committed to this as their particular project. This is how they want to see things go forward. And so maybe Maduro isn't even capable, doesn't have the power to do it at this point. Mm -hmm. And how, how do you assess the strategy of the opposition in the face of this Sunday's vote? Um, calling of strikes, all of the things that we're aware of, and how is that playing out? How effective is it? How wise is it? What is, how, do you, how do you see it? It's, al it's almost impossible not to reflect on the mistakes that the opposition made earlier on in the Chavista era. Um, it seemed to me that you know, in, the, in the, the, the major crisis that occurred in 2002 to 2004, that the opposition kind of put the cart before the horse repeatedly. Um, it, what they're doing now, I think, is correct. But in, but in 2002, of course, the preference was for immediate action to overthrow the, the president, followed by strikes and national stoppages, and then, then eventually elections. The opposition now, you know, since, since, say, 2007, particularly since 2010, has had a policy, first of all, of accumulating electoral strength. That policy's reached its end. There's no point in talking about an electoral strategy against a government that doesn't, what, doesn't want to hold elections, or at least not free and fair elections. So what can the opposition do now? It can do what it is doing, and it's been extraordinary. And, and I watch this from my window, because I'm my, where I live overlooks the, the, the valley and the, the autopista, the motorway that runs through the valley, and the battlefield, the, one of the main battlefields almost daily in Caracas is, is right there on, on the autopista. So you see clouds of tear gas. I mean, it's been extraordinary to watch how Venezuelans have gone out day after day, literally at the risk of their lives. I mean, you said nearly 100 people have died. 
people are risking life and limb, people are um, risking being arrested and tortured, which is not a small thing either. Um, and thousands and thousands and thousands of people do this because there really isn't any alternative except to think in terms of using force. And the opposition basically doesn't have force. I mean, it's not that they couldn't get the guns if they wanted to. Mm -hmm. And there are people, certainly voices on the fringes of the opposition who would like to fight back. But I think they're doing it the right way. This is, this is a nonviolent struggle. But of course, that doesn't guarantee that it's going to win. Um, and right now, whilst I think that we're looking at a government which has no future in the sense that it, it has nothing to offer, it's in a dire economic situation, which um, we were talking a little earlier, um, you and I, about people constantly predicting default and it never actually happening. But this can't go on forever. And we, don't, we can't put a date on it, but it can't go on forever. It's a government with no future. Um, but at the same time, it's the immovable force, and the immovable object and the irresistible force. There's, there's a, a kind of life or death struggle going on. Um, one of the things um, that we, let's talk a little bit about broader kind of paths or scenarios or possibilities uh, in this whole context, which of course is related to what's happening now, but um, kind of what is the, uh, you know, how does this thing, how does this thing ultimately resolve itself or end? Mm. And, you know, you've talked, I think, a lot about, you mentioned in an interview I saw recently about a possible civil war mm. scenario, which uh, there are others that really question whether there are conditions for that or whether that may be a little bit not not quite fitting given given what's happening in Venezuela and a lot of people that think that's not one of the scenarios. Uh, the other is obviously some sort of negotiated, you know, solution and process. Um, and of course then there's just, you know, collapse and, of, of the regime and, and, and perhaps with some violence, perhaps done without much violence. It's hard to know exactly. Um, what do you see uh, happening? And, and, and just if you could sort of sketch out just kind of sort of, you know, what, what are the... That's the, hard, that's, that's the crystal without ball asking question. You to, <laughs> without asking you to predict, maybe you could just kind of give us some sort of... Yeah. Some what, other, what, are the, what are the scenarios? What are the scenarios? What are the, some, the, and the probability that you would attach them without sort of making yes. a... Not asking you to make a prediction of what, sure. what's going to happen. Don't hold me to any of this, but... Yeah. Right. Um, right. I mean... There's the kind of Zimbabwe scenario, I suppose you could call it, where, where the regime consolidates its power at a level of extreme poverty for the population um, and retains its power purely by repression. Um, and that seems to be, if you just project where we are now, then that seems to be, the, that seems to be where we're headed, right? So right. something has to intervene. Now, that thing that intervenes could be it could be financial collapse. It could be the default scenario. Um, it could be a split in the army. I mean, you asked about civil war, and, and I think you're right to be skeptical. But there are certain circumstances under which, of course, we don't know very much about what goes on, again, within the armed forces. They're a bit of a black box. But it's quite clear there's a lot of discontent within the armed forces. If there were a split in the armed forces, then you could have a civil war scenario. Um, it's not civil war between the government and the opposition, but it would be actions within the military. I don't assign that a very high probability, but I certainly think that the violence could get, could get a lot worse. Mm -hmm. um, now, a negotiated solution is obviously the desirable one. Um, we kind of, you know, as in, in crisis group, and I suppose um, an organization with the, the name Dialogue is also kind of professionally kind of biased <laughs> towards the idea that talking about it is the way out. Uh, but in order for there to be talks, they must not be, and again, with all due respect to the, to the word dialogue, which is dear to your heart, I mean, dialogue has a very bad name in Venezuela right now. And, it, and it, uh, particularly as, as a partir de, as from the, the, the process of October last year, which was clearly disastrously, disastrously bad. Venezuelans do not like to talk about dialogue. Opposition Venezuelans don't like to talk about dialogue. I like to talk about negotiation. And when you have a negotiation, it's clearly, it's, it's, it's pragmatism. It's what are you going to offer me in order for me to give up power? Unless we get into the scenario where the government collapses, which, I mean, one, clearly it's possible that the government could collapse in relatively nonviolently. 
And, but but I, I think that even, even bearing in mind that that exists as a possibility, it's better that the reconstruction of Venezuela, the re-democratization of Venezuela should take place by consensus and not as a result of a rupture, of a, of a break, a clean break with the past. The opposition, as people will know in, in the audience, has put on the table um, a rather sketchy five-point plan for what it calls a government of national unity, um, making it clear that this is, and I think this is really, this is kind of a, it may sound utopian at the moment, but it, but it is a, it is, a, is an appropriate way to think about the, the crisis, that we need, Venezuela has gone so far downhill that we need a transitional government to, risk, to work back towards democracy. It's not simply a case of calling a general election and saying, okay, the opposition won, therefore the opposition rules. And, and, and the mood, to its credit, has, has recognized that. This needs to be a government in which as many people as possible and as many political factions willing to work towards that goal uh, as possible uh, come together in, 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 in a transitional regime which will lead to the restoration of the 1999 constitution. Mm -hmm. and, and you, you don't, do you have any sense with, I mean, it's like you said, there's a black box, you know, a, a lot of what's most critical in determining how this is all going to go is hard to know because it's hard to penetrate. And, and, but I mean, is your sense is that there's some possibility of some thinking, planning going on within the government to say, you know, at least with some factions that say, you know, hey, this is, this is over, uh, and let's try to think of some, you know, pragmatically, let's try to think of a set of realistic terms that we'd be willing to give and that we'd ask the opposition to give and so that we could actually make this happen. Is there any thought that you're aware of or, or you suspect is happening within, within the government along those lines? Well, it's, it's clear that the government um, continues to seek dialogue, <laughs> continues to seek talks with the opposition, continues to throw out the idea that there could be a negotiated solution, but without so far putting anything on the table that, that would, I mean, there need to be, especially because of the disaster of last October, there needs to be on the part of the government a number of very concrete, specific moves, and also, not just that, to, as in terms of confidence building measures, it seems to me that there also have, have to be in place um, a, a, a genuine negotiating structure with external guarantors. I don't think that the opposition, it would be political suicide for the opposition to go back into a negotiation in which the government can spend weeks or months discussing what it's prepared to do only to renege on everything at the end. Mm -hmm. This has to be a very rigid, you know, there has to be a chronology, there has, there has to be a framework, there has to have to be guarantors accepted by both sides, perhaps through the form of a contact group or, or, or whatever is, is, is most convenient. But, um, I do think that we must assume that the government sees at least a large part of the same thing we're seeing, which mm -hmm. is a terminal crisis. Right. And, that, and it could be in those circumstances that, the, that part of them, some of them at least, um, are considering the constituent assembly as a bargaining chip in that, in that future negotiation. Mm -hmm. They see that there will come a point where they have no alternative but to leave. They just don't think that point has, re has been reached just yet. Mm -hmm. And part of the, the challenge for the opposition and for a very central part of the challenge, the opposition and for the outside world, is to convince the government that now is the time. Because really, in weeks or months, you may just be negotiating the color of the paper on which you sign your resignation or the precise destination <laughs> to which you, you get ejected when, when the time comes. Now is the time to negotiate because, and, and then in, those, in that context, it's not irrational entirely for them to think, let's put this constituent assembly into, into position because that way we have, we're in a stronger position. However, I think that there may be people within the regime who don't see it as a bargaining chip, who actually see it as the future of Venezuela and their own personal future, and that's the danger. Um, and that's where, you know, I mean, it, it, it's quite possible that um, in a couple of weeks' time, Maduro will be simply a figurehead on what is basically a Diosdado Cabello government mm -hmm. um, ruling de facto through this sham assembly. 
and they would see that as something that they could that they could live with that, that live might you know because despite all the since it's perfectly clear that they do not care about the fate of the uh, the rest of the 30 million Venezuelans um, but only about their own fate and, and that of their immediate associates then the idea that Venezuela will be poor and repressed forever doesn't cause them any sleepless nights. Mm -hmm. What does cause them sleepless nights is the idea that they might lose power. Mm -hmm. So if they conceive of the possibility of operating... Now, it does seem to me that if you start to imagine that scenario, that Venezuela, again, is not a viable country unless it has an ex unless it becomes a protectorate, unless, it's, 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 unless there is an external patron in the way that the Soviet Union was for Cuba. Uh, for so many decades. And I don't know about you, but I don't see anybody, I don't see the Chinese or the Russians or anybody else willing to step in and maintain Venezuela, at least in the medium to long term. Maybe for perhaps in the case of, of Russia, who knows, for short term, you know, political gain as a bargaining counter, but not in the medium to long term. I want to get back to the international question in a second. But first, I wanted to ask you about um, if, if you could, because I saw, saw a quote of yours in the Washington Post that struck me about when uh, Leopoldo Lopez uh, moved to, uh, from prison to, to, ha to house arrest. And uh, Leopoldo has spoken here a couple of times. And Lillian Tintori was just recently here uh, when she was in Washington. Um, but I wonder, I wonder if, if that decision, which I think surprised, surprised me uh, when it happened, and, and a lot of people, uh, is, is revealing it all about about you know about what the government is, is thinking, um, and you ha you were quoted in the, in the post because some of the some of the interpretations was that this was to sort of there had been so much pressure through the protests at home and through international pressure that this was to um, relieve the relieve the pressure. And you and you said, did the government really do this to relieve some international pressure? And you said, seems hardly plausible since by conceding this major point, they only encourage the opposition, internal and external, to go for more. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you could just kind of, does this, you know, you expand on that a little bit yeah. and clarify that, because that seemed I, to go against what, as, what as, it was. Yeah, as, you were, as you were introducing that quote, I was thinking, I really hope this is a quote I can defend. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, you know, it, that was very, that was, we'd known about this for, a couple of hours, maybe, I think, when Nick asked okay. me that okay. question. And I'm not sure. I mean, if I was answering it now, I think yeah. I, think I would probably say um, that, it, that it is actually plausible that that, that was. That, because the difference is, okay. it's, it's, not, it's not that, I mean, what I don't, what I don't think, well, I don't know. We, we, we were very confused. We were all surprised by that decision. And there were two basic scenarios. One was, this is a sign. The government is giving a sign that it's prepared to negotiate. And the other is, it's simply playing for time again. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think it was simply playing for time. And so I think it as is probably actually true in hindsight that that, 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 was, that, was, the thing. that that was the case, that they how, however, there's, again, this, this, you were talking about black boxes. There are so many things we don't know. That, remember, that coincided with the G20 summit. Mm -hmm. right? um, Venezuela was a topic of conversation bilaterally, multilaterally at the, at, at the G20 summit. And the, the suddenness of that decision, which caught everybody by surprise, um, suggested to me that, that there was sudden, overwhelming pressure to do that. And what I may have had in mind when I was, when I was saying that was that it's, it seemed like it might be, at least if not on the part of the government, that there might have been an intention or, a, or some plan behind the scenes mm -hmm. that was something we weren't seeing, of, of which this was a larger part. Okay. And as time has gone on, it actually doesn't seem that that's the case. It doesn't seem that that thing that we didn't know, maybe it's because it actually didn't exist. <laughs> you know. Hard to say. Okay. I want to turn out just two more questions, and then we're going to open it up. I see people on their edge of this seat. Uh, you know, just can't wait to ask you questions. But uh, I have just two more, and then I'll open it up. Okay. What, one is you, you mentioned just uh, the G20, uh, sort of the, the issue there that this is, uh, and we were talking before uh, earlier about how this has become sort of acquired, this crisis acquired a more of a global dimension and sort of the geopolitical chessboard is now 
one of the pieces is now Venezuela. So, uh, you know, maybe you can get, maybe you can share your sense of how this has morphed in the way that it has, yep. and also uh, the role of Cuba, uh, which we discussed earlier, mm. uh, you and I. How 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 much do we know about uh, Cuba's role in decision making in in Caracas? Um, China, Russia, and the United States. So how do you, how do you see this sort of what what a, this kind of shift to a much sort of uh, sort of more global uh, land, you know dimension? Yeah. Well, the, uh, Venezuelan political scientists, I know, I think put it in a in a in a nutshell, and I'm, I'll try to think of the best way to translate what he said. I mean, it's, in essence, what it, what he said was this is transformed from a Venezuelan crisis which needs some external gestion was the word he used, like man management, I suppose. You know, it sounds a bit too neutral a term. This has morphed from that into an issue which is, which is an issue of international debate, this, aside from Venezuela. I think the way I put it to you before was that, that um, now major countries in the world are debating the Venezuelan crisis without including Venezuela in the, it, not, not just the government, but the opposition. I mean, the, the, this discussion is going on as a, as a matter of geopolitics. Um, and obviously the, the core of the issue is the Venezuelan crisis. Mm -hmm. But once you look at what will happen if, that, if Venezuela implodes, in any number of dimensions, the, um, the refugee crisis, the health crisis, the organized crime crisis, the, you know, the economic crisis, the political, the, all of these things. I can think of you know, at least those five dimensions in which the outside world will feel an impact. And the outside world very belatedly, let me say, because I think you know, it's worth pointing out that some of the things that are happening now, things that I'm sure you know, the dialogue, and certainly we in crisis group have been talking about for years, if this is not attended to, this is what's going to happen. Well, OK, it's happening now. And, and at the last, at the very last minute, you know, one minute to midnight, the, the, the big players in, in, in the world have started to think, well, we better do something about this. What that means, the more you start to think about that, it seems to me, is you've already you've got a crisis which in itself is very complex to resolve, but which might be easier to fix, in theory, if you had an outside a credible outside agency with enough power to bring the two sides together. The problem is, once it's now that it's kind of taken off into the geopolitical stratosphere, it, it, you, you're starting to get Venezuela in a mix which includes, for example, such easily soluble crises as, um, or, or not crises, but easily, easily easily soluble issues as the whole relationship between Moscow and Washington. For example, if, to put it more clearly, it, the Russians are a, a factor here. They're a stakeholder, to put it that way. If Moscow is to contribute or at least not to stand in the way, presumably Moscow will want something in return. But how do you discuss what Moscow might want in return without talking about the relationship between, without that affecting or, or being affected by the relationship between Washington and Moscow, which here we are in Washington, D.C. I don't need to tell anybody that that's a bit of a complex issue. And that's just the Russians. Maybe the Chinese are kind of easier to resolve in the sense that the Chinese are kind of the banker here. What they want is their money back, essentially, and ongoing access to raw materials. But then you've got the Cuba dimension, which you mentioned. Cuba, I don't think, I don't think it's right to say that Cuba is kind of, um, you know, the external hard drive or whatever. This is not... Cuba does not determine everything that happens in Venezuela, but Cuba has a major influence in what happens in Venezuela. Maduro listens to Raul Castro very attentively, and when he has a big issue to solve, he tends to fly off to Havana. Cuban intelligence is spread very widely across Venezuela. There is not to mention the dimension, obviously, of the of the oil that Cuba that Venezuela continues to supply to Cuba, which is a an issue of an existential issue for Cuba in terms of its of its economic survival. So I suppose, you know, just to sum it up, it's not just because the international community is now interested in solving Venezuela, it doesn't necessarily make it more easy to solve. Mm -hmm. It adds some dimensions which, which kind of in some ways make it more complex. Great, let me ask a final question on, uh, on the US and then we'll open it up on uh, the Trump administration. And, um, um, you know, uh, there's a lot of, 
has been said, you know, all options are on the table is what the phrase is being used now. Uh, certainly one of, one of those that's been discussed a lot has been economic sanctions and uh, perhaps not, not, not buying Venezuelan uh, oil. Um, and of course, there's been a lot of pushback to that idea. Um, and we were discussing earlier, um, you know, the, the increased pain that it could inflict on an already suffering uh, population uh, in, in Venezuela. Clearly, uh, the reaction of other uh, friends and allies of the United States mm. may not be too sympathetic. Uh, the, other, the other issue that I raised with you, and just want to get your take, it was uh, which I'm a little skeptical about, is whether this would, um, whether Maduro, although he would try to use it as a way to sort of to show that this is, you know, there really is an economic war that the United States is against, whether that, that would essentially even work at this point given the depths of misery that people are feeling and whether people saying, ah, it's the United States, whether that actually would even have any traction mm. because we've sort of beyond that point in some ways yeah. uh, in Venezuela. And if, if you could just comment about, uh, we also, another, another quote that you, uh, we, you and I discussed went back and forth. I won't, I won't hold you to this one, but <laughs> you would characterize the Trump administration's policy towards Venezuela as subtle. Which was a, <laughs> no, uh, no, which, I didn't, Michael. Which, which not provoked, not which got me to send you an email <laughs> saying uh, that 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 uh, adjective hasn't been used too often uh, describing that, that Trump yeah. policy. But uh, but but again, from where you are in Venezuela, the difference between what you saw under uh, Obama, let's mm. say, and the Trump administration, and the sort of the the notion that all options are on the table, the economic sanctions idea, getting at least out at a hearing, whether it's, whether whatever's gonna happen, at least it's kind of, there, there seems to be a shift in just sort of, sort of how you see that and whether that you think is helpful in terms of moving in the, this direction that we all would like to see. Yeah, no, I didn't say Donald Trump's policy to Venezuela. Oh, okay. Subtle, I, <laughs> no, I, I said uh, that, uh, again, you know, whenever I was a journalist and I know how this works, you know, you talk to a journalist and they pick oh, out, I know, you, pick I out know. you do this all the time, oh. you pick out, a, and then eventually, you know, it makes you look as if you're saying something you're not. I, what I was saying was that it, it, I was struck by how, you know, nobody knew when Donald Trump came to power exactly how foreign policy was going to work, but there were all sorts of, you know, very, very dire predictions. And, and it was kind of, bearing in mind the low expectations, it was kind of <laughs> nice to see that, for example, they were working with the Mexicans, that there was a multilateral dimension to this, which was, which was, um, which is essential, which is really important. Um, but I'm very worried. I mean, I'm very worried. I, certainly, I can see why you would want to leave all the options on the table ahead of July 30th. That seems to me to have to be carrots as well as sticks. It's, you cannot simply punish the government and expect that to produce a solution. There has, the government, the, the core group, has to see a way out. There has to be an off-ramp, as I believe the phrase goes in Washington. Um, and it has, to, it has to be credible, because the people in, in the core group are well aware that guarantees to former dictators don't always, down the road, actually amount to anything. Mm -hmm. So they're wary of that. Um, next point is that sanctions have to be, there has to be a clear objective and they have to be directed at that as specifically as possible. Obviously we want to avoid um, exacerbating the suffering of the, of the civilian population. Um, but beyond that, we also want to strengthen the legitimate institutions of Venezuela. The National Assembly, which is going to be closed down and many of its, many of its members probably put in jail after the 30th of July, that has to continue to be recognized and it, and it has to be reinforced as the legitimate voice of the Venezuelan people. That's an assembly that was elected by 14 million Venezuelans. It is the only legitimate elected uh, institution in, in the country today. And you can do that, for example, by ins insisting that no international agreements that don't, that don't have the authority, that don't have the approval of the National Assembly are acceptable internationally. That would be one, one way to go, for instance. And targeted, uh, you know, targeted sanctions against individuals, I've in principle no, no problem with that. But it does worry me that the administration is not, I'm not sure, I don't see that they are fundamentally committed as, as, a, you know, as a core value to the democracy and, and, and human rights in Venezuela. It seems to me that Venezuela may be a useful you know, thing to shout about from time to time, and it may help, you know, there may be domestic reasons that, for wanting to do something about it, and it may look good, 
to weigh, wield the biggest stick possible, and that's not going to be helpful. And also, you, I mean, you talked about the internal issue of whether the U.S. coming down hard on the regime would strengthen Maduro's support. I don't; it won't increase Maduro's support. But what it does do is it helps them to 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 consolidate a narrative, and the narrative issue is very important to that. They need a way, and, and, and when we talk about an, an exit strategy, they have to have a way somehow to explain to themselves and to their hardcore supporters what it was that happened. And if you're going to give them the story that this was an imperialist plot to overthrow Maduro, that really is not helpful, I don't think, in, in any sense. But Maduro has been shouting for years about an economic war against Venezuela, against his government, which doesn't exist. But it will after the 30th of, of July, very likely. Great. Thank you. I'm going to take the off-ramp myself <laughs> and uh, open it up to, to uh, for all of you. If you could just please, uh, we'll start with you, and if you could just please tell us who you are and be brief. Yes, we're going to start with you, because I see you've been anxious to ask a question even before he started to talk. <laughs> you had a question for him, so I could, I could tell. So. Good morning. Thank you. My name is Emmanuel Davalillo. I'm a Venezuelan researcher at the American University specializing in uh, UN peacekeeping operations. Um, as you know, Secretary Guterres has been very strong about conflict prevention and has this whole framework that's trying to launch around the world. Do you think that in the case of Venezuela, where the United Nations have not been mentioned whatsoever out of fear of the Security Council because of Russia and China, mm -hmm. that the Secretariat can actually exert some pressure or even help facilitate a mediation process with some expertise that can be in the shape of a special envoy or something that resembles what we had in 2003 and 2004 where we actually had professional mediators with the UNDP working with the Carter Center and the OAS. Thank you. That, that's, a, that's a very good question. Um, I think that the, I can, I can quite understand Sam, why Secretary General um, Guterres, who is a cautious man by nature, is, is being very cautious on, on Venezuela. We've seen what happened to the Vatican. The Vatican got terribly badly burned last year by becoming involved, and the UN really is the last port of call. I can, I can really envisage a point at which the UN will have to be involved, and that will require the Security Council. Um, uh, but in the meantime, I think you're right. I mean, we actually, as crisis group, we have, I don't remember whether we formally recommended it in a, in, a, in a report, but we've talked a lot about the possibility of recommending that, the, that there be um, a special representative of the Secretary General appointed. Well, my personal view on that is that it would be a good idea. I think the Secretary General is very reluctant to do that. Uh, I'm not quite sure what the, what the reasons behind that are. But I think as this, you know, un unless we see a, a, a miraculous solution to this in the next six months, which I, on the whole I'm pessimistic about, I think that this will come back to the Security Council. And I think that the United Nations, unfortunately, is going to end up having to, to deal with this. Um, it, it's, it obviously, now that this is, as, as, as I said, a, an issue which is which is broken free of just the purely Venezuelan or even Latin American context as an international geopolitical issue. Um, you've got three three of the permanent members of the Security Council are clearly engaged here; they're stakeholders, and it, it does seem to me that that, that, the, that, that that at this point, whilst I don't think there's a case for full-scale UN involvement, I do think that there's a case for this being discussed very intensively behind the scenes. And I know Secretary General Guterres has been doing that to some extent. But I think there needs to be much more to try to bring um, these players together in a more, you know, not in a full-scale meeting of the Security Council, but, but in a way in which they can reach some sort of agreement behind the scenes, yeah. Thanks. Uh, we'll go to Ambassador McFarland, Steve, uh, who served as DCM in Venezuela, right? And Ambassador of Venezuela, here's a microphone, and, and was Ambassador to Guatemala, Bolivia, and other places. Steve. And also served in Maracaibo back when it was uh, uh, Venezuela Saudita. Mm. So uh, first of all, uh, Phil, uh, congratulations on your superb reporting throughout the years. That really eliminates our uh, what is going on in, mm. in Venezuela and the region. Um, going back to your comment about the narrative, um, one thing that has really struck me in the last year of reading the reporting is the the uh, indications of a a dramatic uh, uh, drop in 
support for the regime in areas where the Chavistas had really been dominant, and that the and that the opposition marches are no longer the are much cut across classes now, according to the reporting. I, uh, how do you see the government post uh, post Sunday uh, addressing that issue of the fall off in uh, support in Chavista areas? And how do you see the the opposition uh, addressing it? And what does that mean for the government's narrative uh, and its ability to control people within the government and the PSUV? Thank you. Yeah. Um, from the how is the government going to control? I mean, you're absolutely right. That, that, that is a, a phenomenon, particularly in the last few months, and we've seen it very much so since the demonstrations began at the beginning of April, that a lot of these demonstrations are not called by the mood. They're actually spontaneous demonstrations in very poor areas of Caracas that go on for hours sometimes with, with serious clashes between you know, local residents and the National Guard and National Police. Um, that's a huge problem for the government. And the way that they seem to be resolving it is by threats, coercion, and, and violence. And, and, and I don't think that you can rebuild that, um, that coalition. It's not, they're not gonna, these people are not going to come back, um, which leaves the government with you know, the op those options, as I say, coercion. What they're using when they say coercion, for example, one thing that's really um, uh, shocking is the way in which the government is using subsidized food as a political weapon, the way in which um, it's quite explicit that in many areas, at least, I, don't, I can't say that over the whole country, but in many areas we have evidence that your, um, you know, everybody is signed up in, the, in these communities to receive, whenever the government gets around to doing it, their, their box of, of subsidized food. Uh, but if you go on a demonstration, you are told you will not get your subsidized food. Um, and that's how the government is going to deal with it. Um, as far as the opposition is concerned, they've always been you know, excessively weighted towards the middle class and towards the east of Caracas rather than the west, looks at, you know, simply at the capital. Um, and they still have that problem, with the exception of you know, some individuals who are working very well in, in the communities, with the communities, and are trying to incorporate the poorer communities into a broader, a broader coalition. And that involves bringing on board people who are, uh, have been diehard Chavistas. They need to be involved in the transition, and that's really important. Um, but it's not an easy issue for the, for the opposition. And, and, and since you raised that, I'd also like to say that one of the things that particularly worries me at the moment, and we've predicted this for a while, and now, now it seems to be happening, unfortunately, which is that as the crisis goes on and is not resolved, the mood starts to lose control of the opposition more broadly understood. Um, the particular concern is over what's come to be known as la resistencia, which is not an organization. It's, an, it's, it's, you know, it's the people on the barricades. It's one or two leaders who either wear masks or who appear on videos from time to time. We saw the, the, the absurd case of Oscar Perez and his helicopter. You know, overnight, the guy becomes a political leader who's listened to by people who are mounting barricades. The mood needs to, and I'm not saying that it's easy, but the mood needs to take back control of the agenda. It needs to start being very clear that, for example, in the 48-hour the general strike that's called for Wednesday and Thursday, tomorrow and Thursday. This is a strike. It's not an excuse to build barricades. The two, the two things are different. And the problem is that the, the many opposition leaders, most of them, in fact, either secretly like the idea of the barricades and the trancaso, even though it's anarchy, um, or they're too scared to stand up and say that they don't because they fear that they're going to lose um, votes lose public, you know, among the, among the more radical elements. Like, that really does worry me because the mood has a lot of faults. It's perfectly true. And its individual leaders, many of them, are not perfect. But I would rather that the de decisions made by the opposition be made in broad daylight by, by people who were elected than by people in masks on a, on a barricade who have a, an agenda whose nature, whose precise nature is not always clear. And the government takes advantage of that. And the government, it plays into the government. Into Speaking it. of narratives, yeah, it plays into the government's narrative. Let's go to Hattie, and then we'll go to Ambassador uh, Powell after you, and we'll go back to you. Yes. Thank you, very, thank you very much. I have a question that goes kind of to the exit strategy. And in the regime, we have the usual stealing of state assets. We have the also usual violence against the people of the country. 
but we have kind of an extraordinary phenomenon of widespread and deep narco trafficking and criminal organization. And how do you, what's the exit strategy for people who are involved in those activities? It, it really puts it at a different level in terms of impunity and a negotiation to get, uh, it incentivize the people in the regime to a negotiating table. Yeah, uh, and it's a very interesting question too. Um, my view on that, I mean, I, I, I hear a lot of people say um, you can't negotiate with these people as if you were negotiating with an, an ordinary dictatorial government, if there is such a thing, because of the, the organized crime dimension. And I'm, I, I understand and I respect that point of view, but I've never heard it really argued through. I mean, it seems to me that they're really actually quite similar, that the, the, the difficulty of prizing a, a dictator from power is not necessarily that much more complicated because they're also criminals. Many of them have been criminals and corrupt and involved in all sorts of organized crime. And, 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 and they are unfortunately in, in charge of states. In a way, I liken it to, say, a hostage situation. You could, li you could use the analogy that, that the, the people in power in Venezuela at the moment have the country hostage. And when you have a hostage situation, you don't necessarily go in with guns blazing. You, your first, uh, you, what you first need to do is to try and work out you know, how to negotiate the, the freeing of the hostages. I think that's, that's what we're in. I mean, I agree that the, the, the drug issue is a particular problem in the, sense of it, in the sense that it makes it harder. Obviously, nobody's talking about amnesty here. We're not talking about saying you will go you, you know, you will be given a get out of jail free card. But there may be a need to have these people going to exile somewhere where there's no extradition treaty. That, that, you know, that, that, that clearly could be a, an issue. But it's not necessarily, I don't think, and, and maybe people, maybe Michael can correct me, I don't know, but it seems to me that where you've got crimes, crimes against humanity, which we're starting to see talked about. I mean, I'm not an expert on, on the subject, but I think you know, when you've got a systematic attack on the civilian population, the kind that we're seeing in Venezuela, you start to have the possibility of arguing that these are crimes against humanity. They don't, there is no statute of limitations there, as there isn't on, 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 on drugs. So they're not necessarily well, different in nature, but they're not necessarily more, one more complicated than the other. Uh, that's the towel. Uh, Timothy Towell, retired Foreign Service officer, 31 years in the State Department, but a 20th century person. I'm getting old. I brought with me a patriot from Caracas, from Venezuela, staying with me for a week. He is from Ciudad Bolivar, Pedro Romero. When I took a group of geriatric diplomats down there about 10 years ago, he organized a meeting with a lot of people with Capriles and then a breakfast with Leopoldo Lopez. He's been shot at, kidnapped, and he's still alive, and he's a close friend of mine. The question of the armed forces and uh, factions split in the armed forces. I always thought, from being in the 20th century all over Latin America, that there were patriots in the armed forces, and they read their Simon Bolivar and whatever, and rather being the fat guys in the Capitol with 18-year-old uh, female assistants and their fat wife uptown. Uh, but I've been told, forget about it, what Hattie was, what they were talking about. Forget about it, because there's no money in Venezuela at all for anything. So the, it's the official policy of that sovereign government to traffic in cocaine and allow every soldier from a private to a general to cocaine traffic. And that's what keeps them loyal to this bus driver, who is not as dramatic as John Maisto's friend, uh, uh, Chavez. Uh, what is it? Is that an absolute fact that the cocaine traffic prevents any patriotic soldier from getting rid of this second-rate character, or not? The, sh the short answer, I think, is no. Um, there are plenty of decent people in the Venezuelan armed forces. In fact, dozens of them are actually um, in detention at the moment for various kinds of resistance, refusal to obey orders, disagreeing with the, the constituent assembly and so on. Um, but unlike in, in the 20th century, when um, generally speaking, that much dissent in, in, in the armed forces would lead fairly rapidly to a coup. 
it's not happening and it may never happen. And one of the reasons is that Chavez made, uh, made, uh, his po made it a point, made a point of restructuring the armed forces in such a way that it's become actually quite difficult to do that. That's one point. Another is not to underestimate the indoctrination. I mean, many of the people in the armed forces see themselves as patriots. But of course, they see themselves as patriots in the way that Chavez saw himself as a patriot. And they interpret patriotism as loyalty to the revolution. And that indoctrination over, over nearly two decades now has, has, had, has had an impact. Um, and the corruption certainly is a factor. I wouldn't want to dismiss it. It's, it's, it. Not everybody in the armed forces is corrupt. But sufficient people in sufficiently uh, key positions have been so severely corrupted by this, not just by the drugs trade, but also by their, um, the, the fact that they're now allowed, the military collectively is allowed to get involved in the oil industry and mining. There are major, uh, sorry, I should say, um, senior military figures um, with significant mining interests in the Guayana region and um, from, from where your friend comes. Um, and that complicates things, because not only do they have a stake in things remaining the same, but they have considerable fear as to what might happen to them if things change. John, since you were mentioned, you have the right to ask a question. <laughs> from Thank you for the presentation. Former ambassador to. Uh, John Maestro, I'm nice a retired you, US Taylor. Taylor. Yeah. <laughs> Um, building on Ambassador Babbitt's and to a point Ambassador Tao's comments, have we yet seen in the Western Hemisphere an, a pressure by all the Spanish-speaking countries to say publicly, not only in the OAS, but in the United Nations and wherever, enough is enough. You violate the Constitution. You do not recognize the elected, constitutionally elected legislature. You have political prisoners, and you are human rights violators. This is not acceptable. And use that as a point of departure. Hmm. I would venture to say that we haven't seen enough of that in the Spanish-speaking official world. Hmm. And, I, and I would agree with you. I mean, I think that... Um, um, Secretary General of the OAS, Almagro, has been the person who has said that. And I'm, I'm an, I, I know that a lot of people find that you know, to be counterproductive. They think that, that Luis Almagro's evident identification with the opposition, as, 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 as many people see it, is, you know, rules the OAS out from playing a useful role. I actually don't see it like that. But, but to answer your question, no, we haven't. And yes, we should. The, the, from the very beginning, actually, um, and I'm not sure whether you, you obviously were there at the beginning and you saw this um, for yourself. But I mean, from my point of view, from the way I see it, is that from the very outset, the Chavez project was a frontal, head-on challenge to the inter-American system. And he outright rejected representative democracy, separation of powers, alternative, all the things that are the fundamental pillars of the inter-American system. And for nearly two decades, the inter-American system collectively, its governments, for various reasons, refu either refused to see that, didn't want to see it, um, found it useful, convenient, whatever. Uh, and only now are they starting rather timidly. But even if they did, quite clearly, that wouldn't magically solve the Venezuelan crime. But it's, it's, a, it's obligatory for them to do that. I mean, they're, they're, they're obliged by, by, by treaties that they've signed to stand up for democracy. And they haven't, and, and you know, it's, it's one of the reasons, one of the major reasons why we are where we are today is because nobody said that's enough at an early, at an early enough point. We'll go to this side. Pedro, we'll go to you, and then we'll go to Alex. We'll come back to you. Hi, uh, Pedro Aureli. Good to see you, Phil. Good to see you. Um, rather than talking about how the international community is reacting or not, which I think it's not that relevant when somebody's coming from being on the ground, which I think is a value of having you here. You mentioned the mood and the resistencia. You hinted quickly at the divisions between Chavismo. Mm. You spoke about the Osdao ending up on top. Um, could you actually spend a little bit more time kind, kind of talking about the divisions within the opposition, which had a lot to do with the failure of dialogue and all the, all the tension and all the dis distrust that actually leads to the resistencia? 
as a response to what they see is this very divided mood because we talk about the opposition being united in reality it's a lot more disunited than we think also talk about what's happening within chavismo and within that i'd like you to, to explain a little bit more why you think it's Diosdado who comes up and not hawa mm. who's really the guy who's behind the organization of the national constituent assembly and it's basically more of a cuban lackey which is exactly the opposite of the way Diosdado sells himself so i see those two guys in conflict rather than yeah. having Diosdado be the guy who ends up on top yeah yeah um as far as the opposition goes, well, you know, as, as, as most of you know, I mean, the, the MUD is an organization of more than 20 parties, of which the four, the four big parties are, are, are the ones that call most of the shots. And obviously, they don't. I mean, they don't agree on, on many things. One of the things that Maduro has done, um, rather counterproductively from his point of view, is that he has, for want of better options, I suppose, ended up uniting the opposition tactically. I mean, in 2014, they were severely disunited tactically. You had the La Salida faction, which, in, which was Leopoldo Lopez's Voluntad Popular. It was um, Antonio Ledesma and Maria Corina Machado um, on the streets at a time when UNT, AD, and Primero Justicia were not in agreement with that strategy. And now you have them all working from the same page. To that extent, they're, they're united tactically, and that's important. They're not really united strategically. Um, and I think you can see that in the, this five-point document they came out with the other day. The reason why it's so sketchy is they can't agree on what they would actually do. So that there are some things that are good that are positive in that document. But clearly, in the actual, in the details, they're, they're, they, they, they might well fall apart. Curiously, though, one of the things that's happened in recent years, since 2014, is whereas Leopoldo and Capriles were on, in opposite camps in, in, those, in those days. P, uh, Primero Justicia and, and Voluntad Popular um, were, were clearly poles apart, and the personal relationship between Leopoldo and Capriles was strained. Um, those two parties, curiously enough, now are much more, uh, they're, they're much more united in, in, in tactical terms. And, and one of the problems is that you have, particularly Henry Ramos of Acción Democrática, and you have UNT. Um, who quite frequently act as a kind of um, obstacle in, in the way of, of opposition unity. Um, and it does make things very complicated because it, it, it allows, the, I mean, it, it weakens the opposition quite clearly. Um, it means that they're always, principally because of the presidential ambitions, let's be honest about it, among um, a number of these individuals, they're continuously looking over their shoulder to see what political gain they can get out of a particular strategy. It's not so much the case of the people, if you talk to mid-ranking people in the parties, there's a lot more unity, it seems to me. And it may be that there's going to have to be, at some point, a generational relevo, a kind of, um, uh, how do you say that in English? Um, take, takeover by the, by the younger generation. Transition. Um, it's a lot. They're young. Oh? Leaders are young. The, well, the leaders are young, but yes, and, and they'll be around for a long while, unless, of course, they're in jail uh, <laughs> or in exile. Right. Um, and the, the point you make about the, about the government side is a very interesting one. I mean, this is, the, the, the regime is a kind of unholy alliance between the hardline radical civilians. This is very, very schematic, but obviously hardline radical civilians like Hauer and military people like Cabello, whose interests don't seem to me to be ideological in any, in any shape or form. They're purely to do with power. And that alliance has worked very well to keep the regime in power. Whether it will be sustained on, in, in, if they come to blows over the Constituent Assembly, I don't know. But there is one major difference, obviously, between how there are several, but there's, there's one particular difference that comes to mind between Hawa and Cabello. It's that Cabello, I think, has strengthened his, his control in the armed forces just lately, whereas Hawa, although he has civilian, um, armed civilians at his, um, under his control, theoretically, I don't think that if this is going to be a, a government essentially of uh, force and repression, that Hauer can come out on top in that struggle, despite the, the link with Cuba or whatever. But it's a debatable point. I mean, I, you know, I think it's an interesting one to, to talk about. Thanks. Alexandra. Um, I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on the comments you just made on 
the divisions within the opposition, mm. and in particular, what the release of Leo Lopez might mean mm. for the dynamic within the group. Yeah, I, one of the theories, um, going back to the quote that I wasn't entirely sure <laughs> about defending, one of the theories about why the government released Leopoldo Lopez is that as it was ticking the boxes in terms, well, what do we lose, what do we gain? Because there's obviously a loss. The government, the government did lose, especially with its hardliners, by re releasing Lopez. Lopez was a, a, kind of a, a, an emblem for the, for the hardline. Uh, they wanted to keep him in jail forever. Um, but there were a number of things that Maduro co conceivably got out of that. And one of them potentially could be sowing division in the opposition. And I thought it was quite interesting that the terms on which he was released didn't seem to prevent him from talking, prevents him talking about the procedure under which he was released. He hasn't said anything, and I presume you know, that, that may well be because he thinks that if he does, he'd go back to jail, or it may be because he thinks that that is a trap that the government is setting. But it is a matter of dissension. I'm not sure, um, you know, the, the, it's constantly you know, back and forth on social media at the moment, you know, what does Leopoldo really think? and and. Is Freddy Guevara really speaking for him, or does Lillian Tintori really speak for Leopoldo? And, and uh, you know, it, it is an issue. It was an issue when he was in jail as well. Uh, that's true. But um, there is, it's, it's, like I say, it's these, these, the individual, because Venezuela does not have a single leader or a single party that is capable of, 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 of exercising control, then we're going to have to deal with this. This is, this is going to be the issue. And it will be an issue. Um, if there are negotiations, um, because it'll be very important that the opposition, whoever goes into that on behalf of the opposition, um, really does speak for the opposition, and the opposition speaking with one voice. Uh, Miguel? So a few more questions. <clears throat> I'm Miguel Schloss from, from Chile. Uh, every time I come to Washington, I'm always struck about these discussions about international meetings, resolutions, facilitations, all kinds of things of that sort. Uh, is there any, say, half a dozen cases of evidence where this has, has worked? And if so, what can one learn from those success cases of external involvement in a situation like Venezuela? Needless to say, I'm asking this with deep, uh, with deep uh, doubts. Yes, I mean it is. It is for, every case is different. It's it, it's clear that there are you know that you, you can't simply take um, uh, you know what worked in one country and apply it um, automatically to another. I've been looking much more rather than looking so much at um, examples for you know, for instance where where sanctions may have worked particular kinds of sanctions, what they, how, you, how you can apply them. And I think it is worth looking at that. Looking more at where transitions have been successful um, on the assumption that the only way, the only way that this is going to be, um, that this is going to be successfully resolved is if we do have a transition, as I was saying before, a transition and not a, and not a rupture. And I think that one of the things that the, um, that the international community not only can do but has to do and then that does help um, is to provide somehow the framework to provide safety net would be the wrong word, but but to somehow contain this in a way um, that promotes that kind of exit rather than foment because he, because it's not just a case of what you can do it's what you shouldn't do. There are ways in which the international community cannot can act that will make things worse that will exacerbate the, the, the probability that this is resolved violently. And so it's, there, there are, there are, I, I can't think of offhand of a, of a single um, outstandingly successful <laughs> case of, 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 of international uh, pressure being applied. But I do think that there are arguments for, for not saying that because it's difficult to do, we shouldn't do it. I mean, I think there are certain things that have to be done and things that, and that there are better ways and worse ways to do them, and that's the way I would put it. Yeah. Just as a, as a point of, you know, I remember uh, the days of Plan Columbia uh, in 2000. Um, the question that was most frequently asked to me and to many others was, give me one example of where a plan like this has actually worked, try to reduce state authority, reduce violence. And it was very hard to think of any example. 
And you know, um, people said, well, the fact that there's no example doesn't mean that it's not worth doing. And I think people would say, despite problems of playing Columbia, which is, I don't want to get into that discussion, but it's had some, some success in, in Columbia. So you know, it's, it, just because if there's no example doesn't mean it's not, it can't work. Sir, you've been very patient. Okay. Yeah. I, I work on leadership. I do research on leadership. One of the things that they, uh, I try to, to see, how can I benchmark the case of Venezuela versus another situations, Eastern Europe, Latin America, for all the transitions that were more or less successful or not successful. We see leadership that has been evolving more into, in the 21st century, to a more collective emerging forces versus the classical individualistic leader-centric uh, forces, and we see in the Orange Revolution, that for me is a kind of a reference for Venezuela that could, could be done, Arab Spring and others. I see that collectivity that finally are kind of together in Venezuela, those seven million people, but under a theoretical framework, I see a lack of a clear single leader and the lack under a neo-charismatic visionary perspective, the lack of a simplistic, clear-cut message about Besides, let's go back to democracy. What is, okay, but how are we going to resolve this? How relevant do you see those two factors? The lack of a clear-cut leader and the lack of a clear-cut message. Let's make Venezuela great again or whatever. Okay. No, I mean, really, that it could unite internally and externally for that collectivity to be effective. Yes. The two things are related, obviously. Um, you know, the, the fact that you don't have a single charismatic leader may actually not be entirely bad. We had a single charismatic leader, and we'll look where we got. Um, so that, you know, there, there's an upside to that, too. But it is the case that um, nobody is capable. You know, the, the message is not simple because they can't agree on the message. Because quite a lot of the time, to be honest, you know, the mood, even the G4, the core group of the mood, or the G9, uh, as it is now, they don't meet. You know, it's remarkable. They don't actually get together. There, uh, there are meetings, but the, but the core group often doesn't meet. And so you find that Capriles is saying one thing, Frey Guevara is saying another thing. And, they, and even in terms of the simple language that they're using, it doesn't coincide, <laughs> let alone what you're actually, what, what, how the supporters of the opposition are supposed to interpret that. What does it mean? Are we going? What does what does oracero mean? For example, is a phrase that they. You know, it took them a while to kind of work that out, and even when they did work it out, it wasn't clear exactly what the what the instructions were. So the two things are 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 are, are clearly linked. I I certainly don't think that what's required at the moment. Some people say, but this is a line that the government comes out with quite a lot, obviously, which is the mood doesn't have a plan of government. Well, it's. It, Yes, they do actually. I mean, the plan of government. Well, what they what they first need is 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 a, a plan to restore democracy because this is not an election. This is not. A, it's not. It's not. You're not going into um, you know an election in which you're competing with another political force. Your campaign is to restore democracy so that that kind of election can happen again. But I do agree that the you know simple messages help. It's just that it's very very difficult, even with the best will in the world, to get them all on the same page get them to, to decide. Well, I was discussing this the other day in, a, in one of the sort of discussion groups that I belong to, and we were, we were saying, well, what, what would be the best way, for example, to describe the strategy that, or the tactics that the opposition needs to use on the 30th of July? What are they going to do? Because they talked about boycott. And then, you know, boycott can mean many things. It can actually mean attacking polling stations, for example. Let's hope they don't do that. But I mean, we discussed about, for example, whether it would be good to say, this is a, a, a day to defend democracy. This is a day to defend the Constitution. The precise word you use can often have a, a, a considerable impact in terms of how, how people interpret it and what, how successful it is. But it's, it's hard to solve. It's hard to solve. Sir, yes. Thank you. I'm Gustavo Palacio from Ecuador. I work on issues related to national identity. And, uh, like your opinion on, on two points. Um, recently, the Dialogue and the Atlantic um, had a, a panel on uh, corruption, and the prosecutor of Brazil uh, mentioned that there is a big crisis, economic crisis, political crisis, an ethical crisis in, in Brazil. Um, and as uh, 
from what he said, we can deduce that there is a big crisis in the region. So my question is, what is going on in Venezuela is part of this big crisis in the region, political, economic, and ethical crisis, a crisis of, the, uh, of this narrative of the revolution, uh, uh, of national identity, uh, the national state, and, and the promises, and, and there is a disenchantment with these promises uh, unfulfilled uh, by these regimes. So uh, w w if you, could you elaborate on that? And what do you think will be the, the future? Are we facing a new cycle? Are we going to go <laughs> through all this thing again and uh, looking for a charismatic leader again? And what, is, what do you think is going to happen now? Well, that's a very big question. <laughs> um, you know, you could write a book about it, probably, or at least a chapter in the book. Um, what, schematically, I mean, why did these governments that, particularly the Venezuelan government, but also all the other governments that came to power that one, one way or another challenged the, the basis of the inter-American system, the fundamentals of democracy? Why did they come to power? And why did they stay in power so long? They came to power probably because in, its, in the first wave of democratization after, the, 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 after the, the dictatorships receded, democracy didn't deliver. Um, and that's very, very clear in, in Venezuela. Democracy didn't deliver, and, you, and the, 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 there emerged a wave of anti-politics. Politicians were seen as responsible, and this is not limited, obviously, to Venezuela. Um, and outsiders were, you know, were brought in, and their response was to smash the system and to bring in all sorts of populist concepts and promises. And they then had the remarkable good fortune that this all coincided with a, a, a boom in, 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 in commodities. And so they were able to finance this nonsense for quite a long time. The challenge now is to recover the initial impetus of the democratization wave and to turn it into something real. And, the, and, and in very, very simple terms, that obviously requires making democracy work for ordinary people in terms of prosperity and in terms of um, seeing that, it, that, that, that there's a future, that there's a link. There's a great opportunity, of course, if it's, if it's seized properly. Um, you've seen what happens when democracy is dismantled. You get poverty. It doesn't follow that if you re-establish democracy, poverty will be fixed. But if you re-establish democracy properly, then it will. And that's the big challenge. It's very, very hard going back to the question of slogans. I mean, yeah, you can't sum that up very easily. But, uh, and it's a complex task. But that's where I think we're at, really. Thanks. Sir, did you have a question? Yes. Then we have the last question here. You've been very patient. My name is Eduardo Blanco. I'm the son, uh, I'm from American Continental Group, son of Carlos Blanco. He works closely with Maria Corina. Mm -hmm. First, uh, I want to say that in uh, my belief that the opposition has never been more unified than it is now. Um, I think you're right in saying that there is not a clear unified strategy, but in, all, in 20 years, it has never been more unified. I want to ask you about what the role of the armed civilian groups yep. is, the colectivos, in the 30th and following that. Is it amnesty, like they're doing in guerrilla groups in Colombia, mm -hmm. or prison? Mm -hmm. And I want to ask you about sanctions in the possibility of sanctions as a sanctioning oil in Venezuela and providing working with Brazil, Colombia, and neighboring states to provide humanitarian aid and to show that there is no economic war waged by the United States. Yeah. Um, to take the last, the last point first, um, I'd love to think that there was a way of doing that. I mean, I, I agree that if, if sanctions are going to be imposed, then it's very important that, they, that simultaneously there be tremendous efforts to um, not resolve because it's impossible to resolve, but to alleviate the humanitarian crisis. But I don't know how to do that. I mean, I don't know what to propose on that. I don't think it's very easy. You can't, so long as Venezuela controls its own territory, which you know, may not be indefinitely, um, it's very difficult to force them to, to accept uh, humanitarian aid. 
if you're going to send Hercules aircraft over and parachute medicines and food in, that's a challenging scenario. I mean, I don't quite know how to do that. I'm, I'm very much open to suggestions. I wish there was a simple answer to that. In terms of the colectivos, the armed civilians, you meant on the 30th, what are they going to do on the 30th or, or after and following? They're a major, um, major problem, um, not just uh, while this government is in power, but in the future too, because, because how do you disarm them? How do you, you know, once, you know, let's assume that the government comes to power that is committed to de-escalating the violence, disarming um, criminal groups and so on. Um, there could be a war, I mean, you know, a, a low intensity war um, by the organized crime elements, including the collectivos, because they're, they operate in a kind of gray area between crime and politics. Um, I think that there could be actually more violence. There could, we could see a worse situation under a, under a transitional government, a democratic government, even than we have now in some respects. I'm very, very worried about that. Um, you mentioned amnesty, but I wasn't quite sure what you meant by... Mm. Oh, yeah. I, I wouldn't, I don't think amnesty, uh, I've not... Yes, um, for the for the collectivos particularly, or there's got to be a transitional justice system. I think any transitional regime has got to have that amnesty. I don't think would be. A, I mean, I don't think that's even really plausible. Um, there will have to be. Um, you know, it's a it's a complex technical question. How do you, how do you set it up? But but yes, there will have to be leniency for people who are willing to kind of turn themselves in, disarm, and and you know admit to past crimes. Quick, quick question, final question, Francisco. Just, uh, there's a microphone, just tell us who you are first. Uh, sorry, my name is Francisco Marquez, I'm Executive Director of Vision Democratica, a pro-democracy foundation for Venezuela, I'm here at the dialogue. Um, so one thing I just always like to remind people, like recently the Unity uh, Coalition put out a document and they actually had an important agreement I think went under the radar and I'd like to remind First, they decided that they would uh, any person who became president out of the unity would not be reelected. So I think that's also very important in terms of incentives. Also, they decided that they would rule, not just be opposition in unity, but they would rule in a unity coalition, which is also incredibly important. And lastly, that they would choose their candidate through primaries. So I think those type of, sometimes we don't give enough credit when they actually do things that in terms of unity and in a very incredibly difficult position. My question to you is, I know you talked a little bit what would happen if the Constituyente takes place, but in terms, in concrete terms, take us to the following week after July 30th. If you can, what Long type term. of actions, uh, what type of actions do you see coming from the government and the opposition? Because that's crossing the red line that has been drawn by both the international community and the opposition itself so far? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of um, unknowns, of course, between now and then. Um, assuming this goes ahead, we know what they threatened to do, close down the National Assembly, uh, kick out the Fiscal General, um, probably jail people, jail some people, Dow's jail, all of the people who were recently appointed to the Supreme Court by the National Assembly. Um, that you know, could be slowed down, I think, by international action. Um, to some extent, I'm not sure that it can be it can be di diverted completely, but I think it can be slowed down. Um, and that that's the scary thing. I mean, once we're into a kind of um, twilight zone, I mean, once that happens, that this this is going to be a sovereign body controlled by who knows, but potentially by the Sao Carreño, uh, which can do anything it likes. And so the the constraints on it will not be in the constitution although admittedly they haven't been for some time now, but the, the, the constraints will be purely de facto. In other words, um, whoever has the guns will, will call the shots, quite, quite literally. And that's one of the reasons why this whole thing is so, is so scary. Bill, on that uh, sobering uh, note, uh, this has been uh, uh, not exactly upbeat but a uh, session, but uh, haven't cheered us up, but you've been extremely uh, insightful, illuminating, uh, realistic, uh, sophisticated, and most of all, subtle. Uh, which <laughs> Michael is which never going to forgive me for calling which trust. Always, uh, which we always appreciate here, and uh, it's been great to have you uh, with us this morning. I want to thank you for, for sharing your, your thoughts with us. This has been a terrific session, and I hope you come back. <laughs>
and maybe with a happier, happier report. Well, you, you may remember that you originally asked me to do this about 10 years ten ago. Years it ago, took right. me a while to get here, but, I, but <laughs> now, now I know where you are. I did, I did, I did. I, I did. know where you are. Right, right, and this, this, is, uh, this is your place, and we hope you have you back soon. So, uh, with, with better news. So, thank you very much. <laughs>